Greater Sandhill Cranes have a long, long history in Northwest Colorado. Cranes in Colorado are part of the Rocky Mountain population of Sandhill Cranes. They breed throughout the Rockies, not only in Northwest Colorado, but also in Western Wyoming, Northeast Utah, Eastern Idaho, and Western Montana. Some nest in the southern portions of the Canadian provinces of Alberta and Saskatchewan. Recent counts show there are about 20,000 cranes in the Rocky Mountain population. Hello, my name is Van Graham, and I'm a board member with the Colorado Crane Conservation Coalition. I am a retired wildlife biologist and worked for the Colorado Division of Wildlife for 32 years. During that time, I worked with various studies involving the Sandhill Crane population in Northwest Colorado. The study efforts were designed to document the status of the crane population, as well as to gather detailed information regarding nesting locations, nesting success, fledging success, and essential habitat requirements for our cranes. Over the years, the Colorado Division of Wildlife employees worked in cooperation with the U.S. Forest Service to see that crane management plans would ensure the long-term protection and enhancement of this iconic species in Colorado. The goal of this video presentation is to provide a historical perspective on Sandhill Cranes in Northwest Colorado. Sandhill Cranes have existed in North America for hundreds of thousands of years, perhaps even millions of years. However, since birds have such small, hollow, and brittle bones, few become fossilized. Thus, fossil records such as we find with large dinosaurs and the woolly mammoth are hard to find. But there are a few examples of cranes and fossil records. At Asheville State Park in Northeast Nebraska, a fossilized crane has been found that is estimated to be about 10 million years old. Also, in Florida, a fossilized crane has been discovered, which is also estimated to be about 10 million years old. After these examples, there are huge gaps in geologic time before we discover more ancient history about sandhill cranes. The Colorado Rockies have been subject to great variations in climate, with ice ages coming and going. The glaciers which formed in the higher elevations carved deep canyons with their slow march downhill over the thousands of years. In some places, glacial cirques, kettle ponds, and lakes have formed. Within the city limits of Snowmass Village, Colorado, a small glacial lake has served as a source of water for the city. During excavations in 2010 to enlarge this reservoir, known as Ziegler Reservoir, a keen-eyed bulldozer operator noticed something unusual turned up by his blade. He got off his tractor and made an amazing discovery. Before him lay the bones of an ancient mammoth. This discovery kicked off an extraordinary paleontological study led by the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. The excavation of the fossils by the Denver Museum was called the Snowmastodon Project. This is a depiction of how Ziegler Reservoir may have looked approximately 130,000 years ago. The lake basin was formed by a glacier that spilled out of the Snowmass Creek Valley. These conditions remained throughout the many years of the last Colorado Ice Age. This painting is by, by Jan Verizon and the Denver Museum of Nature and Science has made this and the following paintings and information available for viewing for this program. This depicts what the habitat may have looked like approximately 120,000 years ago around Ziegler Reservoir. The ice was now gone. Vegetation and wildlife have returned in abundance. The wildlife in the area was dominated by mastodon, giant ground sloths, and the longhorn bison. This species of bison was the largest and heaviest ever to live in North America. The longhorn bison is now extinct, but its living relative is the American bison. This painting shows what Ziegler Reservoir looked like between 60,000 to 45,000 years ago, when the area was dominated by woolly mammoth, camels, and deer. 
Woolly mammoth probably became extinct in Colorado about 12,000 years ago. It's highly likely greater sandhill cranes were nesting in the Snowmass Creek Valley at this time, perhaps even at this reservoir. The mammoth and the deer probably also heard the cranes as they migrated overhead in the spring and fall. Here is Ziegler Reservoir's landscape as it appeared during the summer of 2012 after the dam was completed and the reservoir was filled. Black bear, mule deer, and elk are common wildlife species in the area now. Sandhill cranes still migrate over the valley in the spring and fall, sometimes at elevations above 14,000 feet in order to clear the high, rugged peaks of the Colorado Rockies. Large bones for mastodon and mammoth typically intrigue us the most. However, small bones can tell us a lot about wildlife living in the area too. This photo is of a neck bone of an unknown crane species found at the Snow Mastodon Project site. Bone is larger than a modern day sandhill crane, but could have been from an earlier relative of our sandhill crane, or perhaps even from a whooping crane. The bones show that cranes inhabited the Colorado Rockies thousands of years ago. As we take a giant step forward in time, one of the first records of Sandhill Cranes archaeologists have discovered are those associated with rock art sites that had been pecked into stone by indigenous peoples of North America. Indigenous peoples came to North America approximately 17,000 years ago. Many animals occur in these stone depictions, including bear, mountain lion, bighorn sheep, eagles, owls, and sometimes sandhill cranes. This is a depiction of a sandhill crane that has been pecked into sandstone along the Yamper River in Dinosaur National Monument. It is likely indigenous peoples encountered the sandhill cranes in the same places where we find them today in northwest Colorado. For these people, in the fall, the migrating cranes signal the coming of harsh winter weather and perhaps hard times. Then in the spring, the cranes' bugles echoing across the mountains and valleys signal the return of better times with warmer weather and more abundant food. This photo is of Chief Uray and his wife Chipita, who were members of the Ute tribe of indigenous peoples in Colorado. Chief Uray was a leader of his people and lived in a home just south of present-day Montrose, Colorado. He lived there during the late 1800s. Chief Uray and Chipita most certainly recognized sandhill cranes as they migrated in the fall and in the spring. Sandhill cranes may have even nested in the area where he lived. A lot of people don't realize it, but an outhouse, often called a pervy, can hold a lot of old artifacts that are accidentally or purposely thrown to the bottom of the pit. Archaeologists, as brave as they are, often find amazing artifacts that provide valuable information about how people lived hundreds of years ago. Notice the crescent moon cut out on the door. Other outhouses have a star cut out on the door. These traditional cutouts on the doors go back to colonial times when few people could read. The crescent moon was the symbol for women, while the star cutout was for men. The cutouts also let light into the outhouses, as there were usually no windows. So what does an outhouse have to do with sandhill cranes and chief uray? Here's an example of something related to sandhill cranes found at chief uray's privy on his ranch near Montrose. It's the skull of a sandhill crane and was found at the bottom of the privy along with pig bones and beef bones. The crane was probably shot by Chief Uray or one of his friends, likely as something to eat. A sandhill crane can provide a lot of good tasting meat and offered something different for dinner as a change from the usual of deer, elk, pigs, and beef. As Europeans began to settle the West in greater numbers, the discovery of gold in the Colorado mountains in the mid-1800s caused a rush of miners trying to find their fortunes. Edwin Carter came to Colorado from New York and finally settled in Breckenridge. It has been reported that he was very good at finding placer gold deposits, 
but soon found his interests were with the wildlife in the Colorado mountains. He took up what became a lifelong vocation of taxidermy. He shot and mounted almost every species of wildlife he could find in the mountains. Birds of all species, bison, bear, wolves, mountain lion, badger, coyotes, deer, and elk. In the 1800s, he traveled to Middle Park near the town of Kremlin, Colorado, along the Colorado River, and he shot at least three sandhill cranes. Three of his crane skins still are held by the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. He died in Galveston, Texas in 1900, likely as a result of arsenic poisoning, which he used as a preservative for his animal skins. Authors Bailey and Needrock in their book, Birds of Colorado, reported that Edwin Carter found three crane nests in Middle Park near Kremlin, one at the mouth of the Blue River on June 9, 1876, one along the Colorado River on May 29, 1877, and a third nest in Middle Park with a fledgling on June 26, 1877. This photo shows a sandhill crane that was mounted by Carter. It's inside the red circle along with the swan and many other species of waterfowl and shorebirds. This hanging is in the Carter Museum in Breckenridge. Here is Carter with a wolf and in the background bison, elk, bighorn sheep, and perhaps a mountain goat. Unfortunately, in the latter part of the 1800s, all wildlife in Colorado was under unrelenting hunting pressure from the people who were settling in the mountains. Edwin Carter is buried in the Breckenridge Valley Brook Cemetery, just a short distance north of town. Carter's interests in wildlife provide us with a little more information about what Sandhill Crane populations were like in at least a small portion of northwest Colorado during the late 1800s. This is the Edwin Carter Museum in Breckenridge, Colorado. The museum displays many items from Carter's life. Unfortunately, Carter did not write down many notes or have a diary of his long history with wildlife. He donated many of his mounted collections to the Denver Museum, but many of those were discarded due to unfortunate accidents at the Denver Museum in its early days. Steamboat Springs and the surrounding mountains are at the center of the Sandhill Cranes Range in Colorado. Here is one of the many springs that surrounds the town of Steamboat. This photo is thought to be of the original spring after which the town was named. French tra trappers traveling through the area along the Yampa River in the early 1800s heard the chugging sound of the springs and thought it sounded like a steamboat, thus the name Steamboat Springs. As the West was settled by Europeans from the East, wildlife was so abundant people thought there could never be an end to the bison, deer, and elk herds. Unfortunately, this was not the case. All the settlers, including miners, needed to be fed. Wildlife was shot by everyone, and market hunting became common to feed all the newly arrived settlers. The tragedy of the commons is a situation in which a shared resource system where individual users acting independently according to their own self-interests, behave contrary to the common good of all users by depleting or spoiling the shared resource through their own collective action. This is what happened to wildlife in Colorado, almost to the point where whole species were wiped out. How were sandhill cranes affected by the tragedy of the common? There were probably three factors which influenced the decline of sandhill crane populations in the Rocky Mountains during the period from the 1850s to about 1920. The first factor which affected sandhill crane populations was market hunting. Sandhill crane populations were decimated by market hunters just like every other species of wildlife in the 1800s and early 1900s. They were shot not only in Colorado, but in southern states where cranes spent the winter. The decline of sandhill cranes across North America occurred during this time period. In this photo, there are all species of waterfowl, including ducks, geese, and sandhill cranes. Here's another example of a sandhill crane 
and a whooping crane shot by a hunter. Also shown are ducks and geese. This undated photo shows 19 sandhill cranes that were shot along with what appears to be Canada geese and hung for display. It's another example of how market hunting contributed to the decline of wildlife populations throughout Colorado and the United States as a whole. The date of this photo is unknown, but the writing below suggests why sandhill cranes were becoming extinct. The second factor affecting nesting sandhill cranes was cattle grazing. As livestock operations took off in Colorado, unregulated livestock grazing occurred throughout the rangelands in the west. Cattle were brought in by the thousands and turned out on the common lands. Steamboat Springs became the largest shipping point in northwest Colorado, and in 1913 more cattle were shipped from there than any other single point in the United States. Old timers relate stories of the big cattle outfits who moved thousands of livestock through the California park area, stopping only for a few days to let their herds rest and feed. These old timers told stories of the park being dusty and void of any vegetation towards the fall. The Taylor Grazing Act of 1934 was passed to stop unregulated grazing on public lands by preventing overgrazing and soil deterioration. This is California Park, located about 25 miles north of Hayden, Colorado. It's a long and wide mountain park surrounded by beautiful aspen and spruce fir forests. The park is crossed by Elkhead Creek and numerous other small willow-lined streams. Sagebrush and snowberry are some of the main shrubs. By some estimates, there were only 15 sandhill cranes in Colorado during the 1960s. A former U.S. Forest Service ranger told me one time that his granddad was riding horseback from Steamboat Springs to California Park. As he topped the ridge above the park, he saw smoke and thought the park was on fire. He rode his horse a little farther and then could finally see the open park through the forest aspen. It was filled with thousands of cattle, making the dust look like smoke. The California Park area was one of the last places where sandhill cranes nested in northwest Colorado near the end of the 1800s. The third factor affecting nesting sandhill cranes was the decline of beaver populations during the 1800s and early 1900s. Studies made by the Colorado Division of Wildlife estimate that approximately 55% of the sandhill crane nests in the mountainous high country are associated with beaver, either on beaver lodges, beaver dams, or on small grassy hummocks that grow within beaver ponds. But what relationship do beavers have with sandhill cranes? California Park, mostly U.S. Forest Service land, is like much of the mountainous high country in northwest Colorado and is now great habitat for nesting sandhill cranes. The elevation in the park is about 8,500 feet. However, some cranes nest as high as 9,000 feet, often in beaver ponds along small tributary streams. You can see beaver dams along this stream in the photo. The willow-lined meandering streams are perfect habitat for cranes to construct nests, usually within a few feet of the water. It's hard to imagine that this habitat was so severely impacted by extremely heavy livestock grazing many years ago. Here's an example of a sandhill crane with its nest on a beaver lodge. The lodge offers great protection from predators including foxes, coyotes, badgers, bobcats, and even black bear. The habitat surrounding a beaver pond and its vegetation offers great foraging habitat for the newly hatched chicks, including insects, worms, and even small mammals. Impacts to beaver populations for the fur trade throughout the West were incredible. They were trapped without regard by mountain men during the early 1800s when beaver felt hats were the rage all over the world, especially in Europe. Even after the interest in felt hats changed over time, 
Beaver were trapped without any laws or regulations, and populations plummeted and remained low even into the early 1900s. This unregulated harvest of beaver certainly affected nesting sandhill cranes in Colorado and across the Rocky Mountains. As beaver numbers recovered, the riparian habitat along the smaller creeks and streams began to recover too, and the sandhill cranes began to return. Even though sandhill crane populations were declining throughout Colorado as settlement occurred, a few still managed to survive. One of Steamboat Springs founding fathers was James Crawford, who staked a land claim in 1874. He and his family constructed one of the first homes in town. In this photo, taken in 1881, is of Johnny, one of the Crawford family's three pet cranes. The other two cranes were named Sandy and Susan. Apparently, the cranes were faithful pets and often followed the children around the home along with other pets, including their dogs. This photo again demonstrates Sandhill cranes remained around the town area and apparently close enough that they could be captured. They were almost certainly captured as colts before they could fly. The earliest published reference to Sandhill cranes in northwest Colorado is dated to June 1883 in Ezekiel Shelton's book, The Evolution of Christianity in Route County, Colorado. In the book he writes, I looked out there seated on the ground in front of their tent where the children in a group with their Sunday school songbooks which they had brought with them from Missouri. How lustily did they sing. What a contrast to the howl and bark of the coyote, the guttural song of the sandhill crane, and the call of the wild goose, which were the principal songs we had listened to in the valley heretofore. This is the interior of a schoolhouse in Craig, Colorado, about 45 miles west of Steamboat Springs. The photo was taken 1898. The teacher is Maddie Collum and shows the room with desks, blackboards, bookcases. Mrs. Collum is standing in front of a blackboard. Details of the classroom include a religious poster, stuffed birds, a calendar, and a stove. One of the stuffed birds is a sandhill crane sitting on top of the bookcase. There's no information on where the crane came from, but it demonstrates that cranes were in the Craig area and were apparently held with great regard by the teachers in the school. Other evidence of cranes comes from the Museum of Northwest Colorado in Craig. The photos of Ed Darnell's taxidermy shop sometime around 1900. The shop may have been in the town of Yampa, Colorado, which is just a short distance south of Steamboat Springs. The Sandhill Crane is shown in, in the photo inside the red oval. Other animals include deer, elk, pronghorn, snowy egret, bobcat, great horned owl, badger, red-tailed hawk, sage grouse, a mountain lion, various waterfowl and shorebird species. As we approach the early 1900s and then in the next 50 years, wildlife laws were enacted to help protect the remaining populations of wildlife, both nationally and in Colorado. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act was enacted in 1918 to protect birds. During the period of time when laws were being enacted to protect wildlife, sandhill cranes were not as high a priority as other species. Colorado wildlife management was mostly directed at mule deer and elk management and hunting seasons. Bud Hurd was a game warden stationed in the Steamboat Springs area from the 1930s to the 1960s. He had a great respect for all wildlife and took an interest in sandhill cranes. In 1954, Mr. Hurd found a nest near Steamboat Springs, and I think this is a photo taken of the nest and later a colt. He had observed other nests in Route County in California Park and around the Hans Peak area where Steamboat Lake is now found. Not much information is known about sandhill crane populations 
until interest with all wildlife peaked in the early 1970s with the enactment of the Federal Endangered Species Act in 1973. The Colorado Division of Wildlife jumped in, and in 1973, the greater sandhill crane was listed as an endangered species by the Colorado Division of Wildlife. It was not listed under federal laws, but there was concern in Colorado, especially about how the nesting population was maintaining itself in Northwest Colorado. Initially, small studies were begun with only limited resources and temporary biologists gathering information about crane numbers and nesting sites. Counts were made in September each year at staging areas near Steamboat Springs and Hayden where cranes gathered to feed in wheat fields before winter migration. In 1976, a graduate student by the name of Kathy Benash began a master's degree project on sandhill cranes centered mainly in the California Park area north of Hayden, Colorado. She was the first person that I know of who ever banded a sandhill crane in Colorado. She captured three colts in 1976 and three in 1977. Her study, completed in 1978, provided the most in-depth information regarding the status of sandhill cranes in Colorado. This is a photo of the first sandhill crane banded during her project, a colt with green leg band number E701. This is a Bell Saloy helicopter used to count sandhill crane nests in the northwest region of Colorado in the 1970s through the 1990s. Usually the flights would be done over several days. The helicopter pilot would fly about 100 to 150 feet above the ground searching for crane nests in suitable habitats such as along willow line streams and around beaver ponds. This turned out to be a much more efficient method to locate sandhill crane nests as opposed to ground tracking. The helicopter would not hover over the nest so as to minimize impacts to the nesting cranes. Sometimes the incubating cranes would fly from the nest site, but subsequent ground surveys never showed any nests were abandoned by this survey method. After Kathy Benash's graduate study was completed in 1978, no additional sandhill cranes were banded in Colorado until the latter part of the 1980s when more intensive sandhill crane studies were begun by the Division of Wildlife. Plastic and metal leg bands were placed on colts just prior to the time before they could fly. Some of our banded cranes were observed in the San Luis Valley at Monta Vista National Wildlife Refuge during the winter and during spring migrations. They were also observed at Bosque del Apache National Wildlife Refuge near Socorro, New Mexico, along the Rio Grande River corridor. This was the first Sandhill Crane Colt, which was captured and banded by the Colorado Division of Wildlife on the west side of Steamboat Lake near Hans Peak, about 25 miles north of Steamboat Springs. This banding occurred in July 1987, and a total of three Colts were captured around streams flowing into Steamboat Lake. The large neck bands did not help with the identification of cranes and were discontinued after only limited use. The young colts tended to lose the neck bands as they fed. Binoculars and spotting scopes were sufficient to see the leg bands. Sandhill crane colts were captured at about 55 to 60 days old, just before they could fly. Teams using handheld radios would locate the colts usually with the aid of binoculars, and slowly move in to capture them. Sometimes the colts would hide in the tall vegetation, making it very difficult to find them. This colt was captured near Steamboat Lake in 1990, banded and immediately released. Here is a colt that was captured and banded in 1991 and was probably about 60 days old. Often the colts would become very defensive during the capture and banding. Biologists took care to not harm the birds. Their beaks and toe claws are very sharp and care had to be taken to not harm the birds or the biologists during the banding process. 
Seven radio transmitters were placed on Colts in 1990 and 1991 by the Division of Wildlife. Here's the installation of a radio transmitter on the leg of a sandhill crane colt. The bands were placed above the tibiotarsal joint of the crane, or what typically looks like the crane's knee. This type of battery-powered transmitter could be used to relocate cranes from the ground and from aircraft. It was not as efficient as the solar-powered transmitters available today. The batteries at this time only lasted a little more than a year. The Greater Sandhill Crane Recovery Plan was completed by the Colorado Division of Wildlife in 1992. The plan's objective was to maintain a self-sustaining breeding population in Colorado of sufficient size to permanently remove the Greater Sandhill Crane from Colorado's threatened and endangered wildlife species list. The goal was to maintain, at a minimum, 70 nesting pairs throughout the entire state. Recommendations made by Division of Wildlife Biologists to downlist the Greater Sandhill Crane from endangered to threatened was approved by the Colorado Wildlife Commission in 1993. The objectives of the recovery plan were observed to be moving satisfactorily towards the recovery plan's goals. One of the methods used to protect nesting sandhill cranes in the California park area was to restrict travel during the nesting season. Some nesting sandhill cranes had inadvertently been disturbed by fishermen along the creeks in the park, which resulted in the access restrictions. Greater Sandhill Cranes in Colorado continued to meet recovery plan goals, and a decision was made by the Colorado Wildlife Commission to remove the cranes from the threatened and endangered species list on November 12, 1998. It was found that the number of nesting cranes exceeded the recovery goals with an average of 94 nests over a five-year period. Currently, the Greater Sandhill Crane is considered a species of special concern by Colorado Parks and Wildlife. The biggest change in sandhill crane populations in the last 20 years is the expansion of their nesting range. They no longer nest in the more remote northwest Colorado high country, but have become more accustomed to people and are often found in small ponds and streams scattered throughout the broad Yampa River Valley from Steamboat Springs to Craig. No intensive nesting studies have been made recently in Colorado, but it is estimated there may be from 200 to 250 nesting sandhill crane pairs in northwest Colorado. Every year, the general public has great opportunities to enjoy viewing greater sandhill cranes in their natural habitat in northwest Colorado. The Yampa Valley Crane Festival provides events every year to view and enjoy this species as they prepare for their fall migration. The festival is held in Steamboat Springs and has presentations made by crane experts from around the world to inform and educate the public about these iconic species. Thank you for your interest in the cranes of Northwest Colorado and we invite you to come for a visit and enjoy the cranes and the Colorado High Country Mountains.